So my dad is a, still, they don't know. Um, he's not at his, at his worst as he was, but he's certainly not better because he's not here. So please keep him in prayer. Anna told me about the, the ladies sit in, that's what we'll call it, in the river. She said, I don't have a chair for it, a specific chair. Um, hey, PC, will you put it on like one, maybe not two, but like one, and I'll, I'll speak up, I promise. I'll try to. She didn't have a chair. I said, just take my, my like lazy boy, just take it out there, whatever works. Yeah, okay. And if you guys can't get out, we'll just send Pastor Chuck down there to take his mantle, and he'll slap the river, and he'll dry it right up. We'll get you out of there. <laughs> All right, I'm, I have to savor this fellowship. I won't be here next week. Pastor Reggie is going to be coming from Manassas. He's going to fill in. And I don't know what he's going to teach on. So let the suspense kill you all week long. And you'll find out next Sunday. Today, 1 John chapter 2. That's where we'll be. Chapter 1, John gave a vivid illustration of what true fellowship with the Father looks like. It's harmonious with God, and it's void of the practice of sin. We know it's not void of sin. He who says that he has no sin is a liar, but it's void of the practice, the habitual sinning. So let's read our verses for the day, and we'll pray up. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word how it's ever ready for us to come to it, open it up, partake, and be edified. Thank you for your Son, for not only giving us a Savior, but an example. Lord, that you are a visual teacher. We're here to learn this morning and to just fall subject at your feet. We want you to govern us more this week than you did last week, than we let you did last week. So please give us wisdom now, hearts of understanding, and teach us. Help us to regard your teaching and to hold it dear and inscribe it on our hearts. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Verse 1. My little children... The word is technion, and it's found nine times in your New Testament. Apart from one uncertain time in Galatians that it's used, it's used by Jesus himself in John 13, 33. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And that's how John's using it here. He isn't talking down to his readers as though they're immature children, but it's an endearing term. How Jesus spoke as a parent leaving his children. And as you walk out the door and you put your eyes upon your children, you want to just tell them and remind them, hey, I'm bound to you. And you're bound to me, even though I'm not going to be here. It's recorded Jesus using the word technion, my little children, once in the New Testament. And it was when he was referring to John, when he was speaking to him. 
And apart from that one time, the other seven times that it's used is by John in this letter. And I point this out because of our last verse of today. Verse 6 says, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. John was called this name by Jesus 50 plus years ago before writing this letter. And to this day, when he's an old man writing this letter, he's still a fanatic. He, he's just ate up with the obsession of trying to be like his Lord. You know, Jesus said little children to him one time, and here he just goes wild. My little children, my little children, my little children. How Jesus made him feel loved when he, when he knew he wouldn't be around. It impacted John, and John wants his readers to experience the same thing that he felt, the care of Jesus. My little children. And here John gives his, his second reason for his letter. The first, you remember, was so that his joy may be made complete, that knowing that his readers had true fellowship. And now, it says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have verses and numbers and chapter headings in our, our Bibles. They're just for us to navigate more easily, but oftentimes it does a disservice. Right now it does. John has this rolling train of thought in chapter 1 uh, that we really just need to read and write it right into chapter 2. So let's read verses 7 through 10 of chapter 1 and then verse 1 of chapter 2. So verse 7, chapter 1. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So, the Reader's Digest, have fellowship with God by walking in His light. You have sin. Be cleansed of sin by forgiveness in Christ. Don't deny that you have sin. The purpose of this letter is so that you don't sin. But if you do, there's Jesus. John doesn't want his readers to misunderstand at all what he's saying. There's this rhythmic message of truth, both in regard to sin and love. And it's a message that all parents are all too familiar with, uh, how they carefully convey. John wants his readers to know there's forgiveness found in Christ. And with the very same breath, he can't quickly enough say, don't sin. As we grow in our walk, we learn why. Why we don't want sin to why we don't want to sin so grace may abound. Every parent has this bottomless well of forgiveness that they can draw from for their children. But if only the child understood the grief it causes their parents to have to draw from that, they wouldn't be so quick to sin. If we would remember Jesus down in the dirt, sweating blood in the garden or nailed to a bloody tree how we've come to obtain forgiveness. John knows this. So he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Know the reality of sin and the cost. It's too heinous to indulge in once. That's the attitude. It's not something to practice, to partake with regularity. I'll die before I do it again. Because this is what Jesus died for. John writes, so we view sin rightly and we do not practice it. The next part of the verse reads, better with the conjunction but instead of um, and. So, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But if the irregular happens, we, the truly born again believers, who are walking in the light, we're not forsaken. We aren't left to reconcile ourselves in our own strength. We have an advocate. The Greek word for advocate is parakletos. 
and it's where we get our English word paraclete. The term occurs four times by Jesus himself in the upper room discourse, always speaking of the Holy Spirit. It's the King James rendering the comforter. Paraclete is a compound noun meaning one who is called to the side of another to aid them. Jesus said in John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. Uh, Hebert points out, in the gospel, the Holy Spirit is presented to take the place of Christ in the lives of his disciples, to present him and to plead his cause. As the Holy Spirit presents the cause of Christ in our hearts and before the world here on earth, so Jesus Christ, as our heavenly paraclete, presents our cause before the Father. One who pleads another's cause before a judge, counsel for defense, a legal assistant, an advocate. We have an advocate in Jesus. This is the one whom Job begged for, for someone to plead his case to God. We have it. Let's see how good we have it. Go ahead and turn to the Old Testament in Job chapter 9. There are times in life we're faced with something, a really bad situation. Something by definition that's just a natural cause. It, it wasn't necessarily warranted. We didn't merit it, but we're subjected to it the same. And that's tough, something like that. But, but here, when John says, if anyone sins, that warrants and that merits what we've done, who we are, has made us subject to an all-consuming fire that is our holy God. So Job 9, starting with verse 1. Then Job answered, In truth I know that this is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him once in a thousand times. Wise in heart, mighty in strength, who has defied him without harm? It is God who removes the mountains. They know not how, when he overturns them in his anger. Who shakes the earth out of its place, and its pillars tremble? Who commands the sun not to shine, and sets a seal upon the stars? Who alone stretches out the heavens, and tramples down the waves of the sea? Who makes bare Orion and the Pleiades and the chambers of the south? Who does great things unfathomable and wondrous works without number? Were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. Were he to snatch away, who could restrain him? Who could say to him, what are you doing? God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him crouch the helpers of Rahab. How then can I answer him and choose my words before him? For though I were right, I could not answer. I would have to implore the mercy of my judge. If I called and he answered me, I could not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he bruises me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to get my breath but saturates me with bitterness. If it is a matter of power, behold, he is the strong one. And if it's a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am righteous, my mouth would condemn me. Though I am guiltless, he would declare me guilty. I am guiltless. I do not take notice of myself. I despise my life. It is all one. Therefore I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? Now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. They slip by like reed boats, like an eagle that swoops on its prey. Though I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my sad countenance, 
and be cheerful. I am afraid of all my pains. I know that you will not acquit me. I am counted wicked. Why then should I toil in vain? If I should wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes would abhor me. For he is not a man that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Let him remove his rod from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but I am not like that in myself. Without Jesus Christ advocating for us, placing his hand on us both, pleading our case before God, what could we say? What could we do? Were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Who could say to him, what are you doing? If it is a matter of power, behold, he is the strong one. If it's a matter of justice, who can summon him? He is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. Without Jesus Christ as our mediator, all we could expect from God is rod and dread. Hallelujah, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, when we imagine, you guys can flip back, when we imagine Jesus being our heavenly paraclete, our advocate with the Father, it's important not to get the, the wrong image of what's taking place in the throne room. It's not as though our heavenly Father has a desire to pour out judgment upon us every time we sin, and Jesus is there restraining him and holding him back. There's no opposing views in the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are on the same page all the time. There's no division, no dissension. There's perfect unity within the Holy Trinity all the time, from before time, now, and forever. The Father does not represent harsh judgment, devoid of love, and Jesus doesn't represent compassion, devoid of justice and judgment. 1 John 3, 1, you read of a Father's love. Revelation 6.16, 6, you find the wrath of a lamb. And the advocating for us by Jesus to the Father, he isn't constantly giving defense for the wrong we do, trying to rationalize and provide rhyme and reason why we did what we did, why we committed the sin. That's how man defends himself. That's Adam in the garden. Lord, the woman you gave me. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't try to justify our wicked actions. That would only be necessary if we weren't already justified and condemnation were on the table, and it's not. Romans 8.1 says that, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're already justified. There's no wrongs to right. Finley said, The case is not that of love pleading with justice. So the gospel has often been distorted. But justice pleads with love for our release. As our advocate, Jesus stands between us and the Father. God sees not our sins, but the righteousness of Christ. That's it. The title of Jesus states his defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Revelation 12.10 tells us that Satan brings up our sins before God to accuse the brethren, not Jesus. The Father and the Son aren't sitting around heaven talking about our sins. Our sins aren't even brought up. Psalm 103 tells us how the Lord regards us. Listen to this. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, 
So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Do you know how far the east is from the west? Go east. You'll never find the west. Can't say the same about the north and the south. If you go north long enough, you find south. But if you go east, circle the globe a thousand times, you'll never find west. How do you do that? Look at verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. We're eternally separated from our sins because an eternal God died. Propitiation is the Greek word helasmos, and it's only found in the entire New Testament twice, both by the Apostle John in this letter, once here and once in chapter 4, verse 10. It means appeasement or expiation to satisfy what's required. In the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's used for forgiveness and atonement to remove offense. He himself is the propitiation for our sins. He is the emphatic personal pronoun. Himself, he himself is the propitiation. Jesus didn't give something in place of something. He is the reparation for sin. One commentator said this, quote, Since John has described Jesus Christ as our personal advocate, one might have expected him to speak of him as our propitiator. Then his work would have been equated to that of the high priest in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, when he sprinkled the sacrificial blood on the mercy seat to cover the sins of the people so that God could again deal with them in mercy. But that would have been to miss the heart of the Christian gospel. Unlike the Old Testament high priest, Jesus Christ is himself the propitiation for human sin. John's statement declares that Jesus is the sacrificial victim as well as the officiating high priest. And the present tense is, declares that his sacrifice possesses a continuing quality. He was and is and will continue to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins forever, even in heaven. That's why our sins don't get brought up. We have forgiveness through his continuous propitiation. But listen to the rest of our verse. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Jesus Christ is the restitution for sins of the whole world. All of mankind for all time. And when John says not for ours only, he's referring to himself and fellow believers. But also for those of the whole world, that's everyone else non-believers. Jesus is the propitiation for the sin of the world. That's something that we cannot fully grasp. And in heaven, we will not be able to grasp and, comp grasp and comprehend the depth of that statement, of that reality. I can understand my personal sin. Duh. We, we have to to be able to repent. I can wrap my mind around what I've done. But committing sin is like throwing a rock into a placid pond. I can see that I did something. I know, okay, I threw a rock in it. I might even consider the effect as a, a splash. I'm not taking into account the 27th ripple down the pond or the water below the surface that was displaced to make room for the rock. I can't quantify that. Sin has cosmic consequences and the repercussions of one sin is immeasurable. We can't measure or calculate the consequences of just one sin. And Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection atone for the history of the world. To atone for the sin of the entire world. Blood that he shed 2,000 years ago. And after we go to heaven, those who, those who don't, those who reject the love of God and stand before the great white throne judgment, who stand guilty, the blood of Christ will still be the propitiation for their sins. 
he still will have died for their sins, and they'll be thrown into the eternal lake of fire, even though restitution was made for them. They reject it. And that's tough to ponder. Imagine how Jesus feels. He died for them. Now, he was whipped and he was spit on and nailed to a tree just so they could reject him. He came and he was tortured for a people who would deny his existence. For a people who would say, he's cruel. He revealed himself to his creation. He, he healed them. He fed them. He loved them. And they killed him for it. And they call him a bigot. He died for a people who twist scripture so much. They misrepresent him so much. Today, they, some teach that Jesus was gay and that God is trans. That's, that was tough for me to type in my notes to put those words so close together. And Jesus died for them. I don't want Jesus to have died for those people, if I'm honest, in my flesh. I don't want Jesus to have died for the sins of a child molester, but he did. He himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. Why would he do that? I find so much wrong with the way God did what he did. I have, I have so many problems with it. And the Bible tells us the same thing. Romans 5, 6 says that what God did. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And Romans 5, 7 says what man would do. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. What Paul was speaking of in Romans there, and what John is pointing to here, when he tells us God died for the world, is love. It's what separates God from man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John brings to mind the supreme love of God. And he moves on to verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. What were his commandments? Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. For this is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Love God. Love each other. We know we've come to know him and how we treat others. If I'm loving God supremely... I'm loving my neighbor as myself. And if I love someone as myself, I don't want to be murdered. I don't want to be robbed or lied to. Romans 13.10 Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. With this one principle, we don't need to go down the list of the Ten Commandments and make sure I'm doing this, I'm not doing this, I need to do this, I don't do that. If you love someone, you won't steal from them. If you love God, you won't take his name in vain. Love God supremely and love each other. This is what Paul meant in Galatians 5.18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You don't need the law. It's weak. It's obsolete. Jesus fulfilled the law and gave us his spirit instead for all who would repent and believe. And the world is full of people without the spirit of God indwelling them. And we see the effects of that and how they treat each other. Romans 3 says their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. John just told us God isn't like that. He's loving. He loved the whole world. So look at verse 4. The one who says I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I've come to know. The gnosko, the experiential knowledge. This is the difference of knowing of God and knowing God. 
Knowing the Word of God and knowing the God of the Word. You've experienced God. And you have a working relationship with God that only happens through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11 through 14 says what this looks like. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. If you're born again and you know God, you're led by his spirit, you won't be selfish. You won't be self-serving, self-preserving. That's the spirit of man. The spirit of God wants to keep the commandments of God. Love God supremely and love each other. And if I told you I've come to know God, you'd expect me to love. Because that's who He is. That's what His Word commands. Look at verse 5. But whoever keeps His Word, in Him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. His Word. And His Word isn't referring to one singular command. But it's the sum total of his revealed will, his ethical demands for everyday obedience. Whoever obeys him, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. God's love has attained its intended purpose. That's what it means. It's had success in what it sought to do. What's God's, what's God's love's intended purpose in our life. Romans 5.5 5 says, The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through His Holy Spirit who has given us. What does that look like at 100% with my flesh not hindering it, holding it back, I don't restrain His love? It's the end of myself. It's to love sacrificially. It's where I would in my flesh draw the line and say no. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. Bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, all things to which my flesh says, yuck, doesn't want anything to do with any of that stuff. Which is exactly why when all of the attributes of God's love start manifesting in our life, we can know, I've come to know him. You look radically different than the rest of the world. The born again believer pretty much does the exact opposite as the rest of the world. If you, it's been said, if you can't find wise counsel, go to an unsaved relative and do the exact opposite of whatever they tell you to do. You'll probably fare okay. Because they're all slaves to sin and they're serving their own flesh. They don't obey Christ's commands. But whoever keeps his word in him the love of God has truly been perfected. Whoever loves God loves his neighbor, proving the reality of the love of God. And the last part of verse 5 really is a part of verse 6. By this we know, the transitions in, that we are in him. Verse 6, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Abide is to remain. There's unbroken fellowship, continuous fellowship derived from obedience to his word. 
and the end result being we walk in the same manner as he walked. Our lives are fashioned to his. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Walk like Jesus. He had compassion on people. Jesus loved. He loved everyone. I wouldn't. Loves everyone. I don't want to. He loved the unlovable. He touched the untouchable. He came for harlots, tax collectors, drunkards, thieves. The confused, blue-haired, social justice warrior Jesus died for. The one that I won't even have a two-minute conversation about heaven and hell with. That's not the love of God being perfected in me. The Father wasn't partial to only send His Son to die for particular people or particular sins. Jesus wasn't partial to, to talk to particular sinners or heal particular ailments. And the Holy Spirit isn't partial about who He pours out on. He fills Jews and Gentiles alike. We should get excited when we see someone confused because they're looking for answers. Get excited when you see a BLM sticker. Why isn't the reaction, great, they think human life is valuable. Perfect. That's better than a handful of Republicans that would rather get an abortion and buy another dog. At least they value human life. I know. I'm going to go talk to them about the Ethiopian eunuch who Philip baptized in Acts 8. Perfect. Why isn't that the reaction? What would Jesus do? Go tell him or go pet that St. Bernard. What's more inviting to us? When did what, what would Jesus do become uncool? That's a great question. When did we all stop wearing those bracelets? It's a great question to ask. How do I demonstrate the love of God to people? How do I ultimately love my neighbor? Everywhere he went, he loved people, all people. He truly loved people. He was full of grace and truth. He was unwavering in both love and truth. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Jesus loved us enough to leave his throne room in heaven and told us enough truth that we killed him for it. He never shrunk back from the will of God. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It's easier said than done, but it has to be done. That means never shrinking back from the will of God. And if you all will stand, I'd like to close with a word from Isaiah. Isaiah 11. Verses 1 through 2, speaking of Jesus and the Spirit of God. Actually, 1, one through 3. 1 through 3. Yeah, a little bit. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. There's a spirit of wisdom in that you know what to do. And then the spirit of understanding is you're perceiving and you're, you're gaining understanding on what to do. The spirit of counsel and strength. You can advise, but then you can also do it. You know what to do and you can do it. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Everything we see has to be through the lens of the fear of God and discerning all of our decisions that we make. To fashion our lives to Jesus isn't to just become a sum total of big events. Jesus didn't just come to the cross. He didn't just heal some people, cast some demons out. He lived a life. And for us to 
liken our lives to his manner of life, how he lived, how he moved, to accept the will of God throughout our entire lives. The big moments, the little moments, the annoying moments, the silent moments, trying to live and move like Jesus. That's how the love of God is perfected in us. It's an absolute in everything. We don't give ground to the flesh in anything. We give ground to the love of God in everything. We hold nothing back and we give it all to Him. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your Son who advocates for us in heaven. And we thank you for your Spirit who advocates with us now here on earth. We thank you for you, for giving us both, for giving us your Son and your Son sending his Spirit, that you didn't leave us orphans, that we have a comforter in heaven and on earth, Lord that we're filled with your Spirit. Help us to walk in the overflowings. Help us to discern your will for our life at all times and be subject to it. Please give us a heart of subjection for your will. Thank you for your word, Lord, how it endures and how it has power. Let your word trample down our life, Lord. Make it decrease us and increase your son. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for the meal you provided us with downstairs. Thank you for the good fellowship among the saints. Thank you for your church, Lord. For letting us be a part of the bride of Christ. Mm, hallelujah. We pray all this in your son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.